Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part two, Man the Grand Symbol of the Mysteries from Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire, a treatise in three parts by Manly P. Hall. Part two, Man the Grand Symbol of the Mysteries. Pythagoras said that the universal creator had formed two things in his own image. The first was the cosmic system with its myriads of suns, moons, and planets. The second was man, in whose nature the entire universe existed in miniature. Long before the introduction of idolatry into religion, the early priests to facilitate their study of the natural sciences tamed the statue of man to be placed in the sanctuary of their temples. Using the human figure to symbolize the divine power in all its intricate manifestations. Thus the priests of antiquity accepted man as their textbooks and through the study of him learned to understand the greater and more abstruse mysteries of the celestial scheme of which they were a part. It is not improbable that this mysterious figure standing over the primitive altars was made in the nature of a mannequin and like certain emblematic hands in the mystery schools was covered with hieroglyphs either carved upon its surface or painted thereon with everlasting pigments. The statue may have opened, thus showing the relative positions of the organs, bones, muscles, nerves, and other parts. The present generation is prone to underestimate the knowledge of anatomy possessed by ancient races. Owing to destruction by time and vandalism, the available records do not adequately represent the learning of antiquity. Professor James H. Breasted, archaeologist of the University of Chicago, recently stated that his investigation showed that the learned doctors of Egypt during the 18th dynasty, that is about 17 centuries before Christ, had a medical knowledge comparable to that of the 20th century. Professor Breasted is quoted as follows. For instance, in it, the Edwin Smith Papyrus, an early scientific document, the word brain appears for the first time recorded in human speech, and there is evidence that the Egyptians understood the localization of brain control of muscles, a knowledge that has only been rediscovered within the last generation. The knowledge which the Egyptian priest physicians possessed concerning the functions of the several parts of the human body not only equaled that of many modern scientists, but as regards those functions and powers concerned with the spiritual nature of man and organs and centers through which the spiritual essences control the body, their knowledge exceeded that of the modern world. During ages of research, much was contributed to fundamental principles of the early philosophers and at the time, Egypt reached the crowning glory of her civilization. The mannequin was a mass of intricate hieroglyphs and symbolic figures. Every part had its secret meaning. The measurements of this stone figure formed a basic standard by means of which it was possible to measure all parts of cosmos. It was a glorious composite emblem of all the knowledge possessed by the sages and hierophants of Isis, Osiris and Serapis. Then came the time of idolatry, the mysteries decayed from within, the secret meanings were lost and none knew the identity of the mysterious man who stood over the altar. It was only remembered that the figure was a sacred and glorious symbol of the universal power. This figure came to be looked upon as a god, the one in whose image man was made. The secret knowledge of the purpose for which the mannequin was constructed being lost. The priests worshipped the actual wood and stone, until finally their lack of spiritual understanding brought the temple down in ruins about their heads and the statue crumbled with the civilization which had forgotten its meaning. Today, the great faith of the white race, Christianity, is served by a great number of honest, sincere, devout men and women. While devoted to their task, they are only partly efficient because the majority of them are totally ignorant of the fact that so-called biblical Christianity is an allegory concerning the true spirit of Christianity and of that esoteric doctrine evolved in the temple by the initiated minds of pagandom and promulgated to serve the religious needs of the human race. Today, this faith is served by millions and understood by only a handful. For while the mystery temple no longer exists as an institution on the corners of the streets as it did in the ancient world, the mystery school still exists as an invisible philosophical structure. It admits into the knowledge of its secrets only a few, permitting the great mass to enter only the outer courtyard and make its offering upon the brazen altar. Christianity is essentially a mystery school but most of its adherents do not understand it well enough to realize that there are secrets concealed behind the parables and allegories which are an important part of its dogma. 
Why should Christianity not be a mystery school? Its founder was an initiate of the Essenian Mysteries. The Essenes were disciples of the great Pythagoras and were also connected with the secret schools of India. The master Jesus was himself a hierophant, deeply versed in the ancient arcanum. St. John, by his writing, proves himself to be acquainted with the ritualism of the Egyptian cult, and it is contended that St. Matthew was the teacher of Basilides, the immortal Egyptian sage, co-founder with Simon Magus of Gnosticism, the most elaborate system of Christian mysticism that has ever evolved from the main stem of St. Peter's Church. During its early history in Rome, Christianity was in constant contact with Mithraism, the fire philosophy of Persia, from which it borrowed no small part of its rituals and ceremonials. If Christianity were looked upon less as a church and more as a mystery school, the modern world would rapidly gain a clearer understanding of its tenets. Every priest of Christendom, every minister of the gospel should be an anatomist and a physiologist, a biologist and a chemist, a physician and an astronomer, a mathematician and a musician, and above all, a philosopher. By a philosopher, we mean one who could study intelligently all these different lines of thought and discover the interrelationship existing between them and use all the arts and sciences as methods by which to interpret the magnificent, emblematic pageant and mystery drama of the Christian faith. If they were to intelligently consider the secrets handed down from the priests of pagan antiquity, whose stupendous genius soared far above the rutted prejudices of modern thought, they would make a number of important discoveries. First of all, they would discover that in the present translation of both the Old and New Testaments are numerous mistakes, owing to the fact that the translators were not spiritually competent to interpret the secret mysteries of the Hebrew and Greek languages. They would find numberless contradictions caused by misunderstanding and would also discover that the so-called apocryphal books, rejected as uninspired, contain some of the most important keys which have descended to us from antiquity. They would learn that the Old Testament was not to be considered literally, that concealed between its lines were certain secret teachings without which the true meaning of the Hebrew writings cannot be discovered. They would no longer laugh at the pagans for their plurality of gods, for they would discover that they themselves, if faithful followers of their scriptures, are polytheists. The word Elohim as used in the early chapters of Genesis and translated God, is a masculine, feminine, plural word, meaning a number of gods who are androgynous and not one supreme deity. They would realize that Adam was not a man, but a species, a race of creatures. They would also realize that the Garden of Eden was not located in Asia Minor. Even if some men knew these things to be true, a great part of humanity would still reject them because they would disagree with the accepted traditions venerated not because they are true, but because they have been accepted for generations. They would crown their discoveries by a realization that the holy land of all nations is the human body, that this is sacred earth consecrated to the gods. They would realize that their own bodies were the holy sepulchers that have long been in the hands of the infidel, and they would realize that there is no infidel of any race half so heartless as the infidel which dwells in the heart of man himself, that there is no enemy to the faith like the lower nature of the individual, there is no Judas like selfishness, no betrayer like ignorance, no tyrant like pride, no Red Sea to be crossed like that, which comprises the emotional nature of man, surging outward from the red blood-forming centers in the human liver. If the modern theologians could see the ancient mannequin over the altar, they would clearly understand all this, but not realizing that there is a secret doctrine, they do not seek for it. Yet who can read the book of Ezekiel and Revelation and not realize that the beloved disciple, John, transcending all the others in his vision, was indeed lifted up, or raised, as the modern mason might say, and beheld the pageantry of the mysteries. The allegories of St. John are drawn from every religion of the ancient world. The drama which he unfolds in Revelation is synthetic and therefore truly Christian in that it includes the great teachings of all ages. Some believe that God has not willed that man should understand the mystery of his own destiny, but let these retail those immortal words. There is nothing concealed that shall not be revealed. There is nothing hidden that shall not be made known. This being true, let us take up the labor of solving or unveiling of reconstructing. 
following in the footsteps of the illumined of all ages, we too shall discover truth by following the winding stairs up which the candidates of every nation and religion have passed, wearing ruts in the stones. The spirit of man is a tiny ring of colorless fire from which pour streamers and rays of scintillating force. By a mystic process, the rays build bodies around that central formless germ, and man dwells in the midst of these bodies, controlling them by waves of force in a manner difficult to appreciate unless one is familiar with the occult constitution of man. This ring of invisible flame is the eternal fire, the spark from the infinite wheel, the birthless, deathless, eternal center, which includes within itself all that it has ever been, all that it is, and all that it ever shall be. This germ dwells in the state eternity, for to this immortal spark time is illusionary, distance is non-existent, joy and sorrow are unknown, for concerning its function and consciousness, all that can be said is that it is. While other things come and go, it is. This germ of immortality enters into the embryo at the time of quickening and passes out at the moment of death. With its coming, heat is generated. With its leaving, heat is withdrawn. As the flaming orb of the sun is in the midst of the solar system, so this flaming ring of spirit is in the midst of the bodies of man. It is the altar fire which never goes out, and to the service of this divine flame, the wise of all nations have consecrated themselves for in this flame lies all perfection and the possibility of ultimate attainment. This flame manifests individualities and personalities, but the extracted essences of experience, intelligence and activity stored up in the individualities and personalities are finally absorbed into this flame, furnishing it with fuel with which it gleams and burns more brightly. From this one altar fire, all of the fires in the human body are lighted like the countless flames which have been started from the sacred fires of the Parsis. Compare the flaming spirit of man to the light of a candle. First, in the midst of the candle, close to the wick, is a glow nearly colorless. Around this is a ring of golden light, and still further out surrounding the yellow is a deeper orange or reddish flame, which gives off more or less smoke. These three lights, blue, yellow, red, are closely related to the flame in man, for there is a blue, fuelless light, and there is a yellow light supplied by a pure oil that burns with a steady glow, giving no smoke. Then there is a red flame supplied with a coarser fuel. This is called the consuming fire of the ancients, for in the human body the blue flame is the clearly burning light of reason, illuminating the mind and lighting the darkness of the night while the red flame is the false light, the fire of passion and lust. It is smoky like the battlefield where hates and fears go up together in one seething, lurid sheet of brick-red flame. These are the three fires, the fire of divinity, the fire of humanity, the fire of the demons. These three are enshrined within the nature of man, whence their radiance goes forth as the sacred trisyllabic word by which the heavens are created, the earth formed, and the works of evil destroyed. The disciples of the ancient wisdom realized that during the dawn of this earth scheme, certain instructions were deposited in safe places by the sons of the dawn, or as we call them, the gods. And that after having ensured that these doctrines would be preserved for the ultimate salvation of the race, the gods entered into the constitution of man and lost their identity. For this reason, it is said that the kingdom of heaven is within you for the kingdom of heaven includes the divine father, his trinity, his seraphim, cherubim, powers, dominations, principalities, thrones, angels, and archangels. Each of these celestial creatures has contributed something to the nature of man. Through the power of one he feels, through the power of another he sees, through the power of a third he speaks, through the power of a fourth he understands. Through the power of the Divine Father, he is immortal. Through the power of the Trinity, he is threefold in his constitution, spiritual, intellectual, physical. Through the power of the Seraphim, the great fires were given to him, while from the Cherubim, he secured his composite form. Hence, these spirits are confined within his own nature until man builds that nature to the point where he releases these cosmic powers through giving them adequate expression and no longer limiting them by his own ignorance and perversion. In truth, the kingdom of heaven is within man far more completely than he realizes. And as heaven is in his own nature, so earth and hell are also in his constitution, for the superior worlds circumscribe and include the inferior. 
and earth and hell are included within the nature of heaven. As Pythagoras would say, the superior and inferior worlds are included within the area of the supreme sphere. So all the kingdoms of earthly nature, the minerals, the plants, the animals, and his own human spirit are included within his physical body, and he himself is the appointed guardian spirit of the mineral kingdom, and he is responsible to the creative hierarchs for the destiny of the stones and metals. The infernal world is also part of himself, for within his nature is Lucifer, the beast of Babylon, Mammon, Beelzebub, and all the other infernal furies. At the basis of his spine burns an infernal fire and the witch's sabbath so glowingly described by Eliphas Levi can be traced to its source in the lower emotional centers of the human body. Thus man is heaven, earth and hell in one and his salvation is a much more personal problem than he realizes. Realizing that the human body is a mass of psychic centers and that during life the form is crisscrossed with endless currents of energy, that all through the form are sunbursts of electric force and magnetic power, man can be seen by those who know how to see as a solar system of stars and planets, suns and moons, with comets in irregular orbits circling through them. As the Milky Way is supposed to be a gigantic cosmic embryo, so man is himself a galaxy of stars, each of which someday will be a constellation in itself. Whichever way we look, we find life. Wherever we find life, we find light, for in the midst of all these living things are tiny sparks of immortal splendor. Those whose eyes are chained by earthly limitations see the forms, but to those transcending materiality, each life appears as a gleam of immortal splendor. Even the atmosphere is alive with lights and the clairvoyant passes through spheres of flame. There are lights of a thousand colors and rainbow hues for surpassing in brilliancy the luminosity of the sun, Lights a thousand times more varied than the spectrum that we know, color undreamed of. Lights so brilliant they cannot be seen, but are felt as ringing sounds in the head. Lights that must be heard. Others like solid columns of fire that must be felt. Wherever the seer gazes, he beholds fire. It pours from the stone. It flashes in geometric stars from the petals of flowers and shoots in waves from the fur of animals. It surrounds man with an aureole of radiance and the earth with a halo of rainbow bands extending miles from its surface. Higher pours light upward through the surface of the earth. It shoots light downward from the empty air. It radiates light outward from the center of everything and inward from the circumference of everything. Is it strange that this universal living splendor was revered? It is man's most perfect symbol of God. For this light is the primary manifestation of the unmanifested and eternal one. This eternal fire burning fuelless in the soul of everything has been since the beginning of time the most sacred symbol in all the world. For while figures of wood and stone, paintings on canvas and even songs are more or less expressions of the form, the physical side of nature, this radiant light, this flaming splendor is symbolic of the spirit, the lifer, the immortal germ in the midst of form. It was sacred to the superior deity and all worshipped it and made offering to it. It was the source and men worshipped the source, seeking by secret culture handed down through the ages and based upon the instructions of the gods themselves to make that light shine out more gloriously from within themselves. This is the source of fire and light symbolism. Light is not only sacred because it dispels the darkness in which lurk all the enemies of human life. It is also sacred because it is the vehicle of life. This is evidenced by the effect of sunlight upon plant, animal, and human life. Light is also the vehicle of color, the coloring matter of all earthly things being imparted from the sun. It is the vehicle of heat, and according to the wisdom of antiquity, it carries the sperm of all things from the sun. Through light also pass the impulses from the grand man. According to the mysteries, God controls his universe by means of impulses of intelligence, which he projects through streamers of visible or invisible light. This light serves the universe in a capacity somewhat similar to that in which the nervous system serves the body. Pythagoras said, The body of God is composed of the substance of light. Where light is, God is. Who worships light, worships God. Who serves light, serves God. What more fitting symbol has any man ever conceived of the ever-living, pulsating Divine Father than the living, pulsating, radiating fire? Fire is the most sacred of all elements and the most ancient of all symbols. This being the case, the ancients were not without reason and philosophy when they accepted fire or light as their supreme symbol and chose as the emblem of the universal light the central glory of the sun. 
In so doing, they became not sun worshippers, but worshippers of God as he manifests himself through the light of truth. The fire philosophers worshipped three lights, the light of the sun, that of the earth, and that of the soul. This latter being the light in man, which they believed would ultimately be reabsorbed into the divine light from which it was temporarily separated by the prison walls of man's lower nature. The mysteries of all ages were dedicated to the reunion of the little light with the great light, its father and source. To the Gnostics, Christ was the colorless divine light which assumed the form of radiant splendor, truth, that it might minister unto the needs of the little light struggling for expression in the soul of every human creature. This divine light entered into the light of nature and by strengthening the latter assisted the vitalizing of all living things. The light in man, the God in miniature, was saved or more correctly released by a process called regeneration. The secret method used to effect this release without the long spiral path of evolutionary progress was the great and supreme secret of the mysteries revealed only to those who had proven themselves worthy to be entrusted with the power of life and death. These mysteries are perpetuated today in Freemasonry. The Masonic order is founded in the secret schools of the pagan antiquity, many of the symbols of which are preserved to this day in the various degrees of the Blue Lodge and the Scottish Rite. Concerning the origin of the name Freemason, which is itself a key to the doctrines of the order, Robert Hewitt Brown, 32 degree, writes, Long before the building of the King Solomon's temple, Masons were known as the Sons of Light. Masonry was practiced by the ancients under the name of Lux Light, or its equivalent in the various languages of antiquity. We are informed by several distinguished writers that it, the word Masonry, is a corruption of the Greek word Misuranio, which signifies I am in the midst of heaven, alluding to the sun, which being in the midst of heaven, is the great source of light. Others derive it directly from the ancient Egyptian free the sun and mass, a child, Freemason, children of the sun or sons of light. The true secret of the regeneration of the fire in the human soul is revealed by the ritual of the third degree of the Blue Lodge under the allegory of the murder of Hiram Abiff. The name Hiram is, as has already been noted, closely related to the element of fire. His direct descent from Tubal Cain the first great worker of metals by means of fire still further connects this cunning worker of metals with the immortal life flame in man. In his secret societies of all ages, Charles W. Heckethorn gives an old Kabbalistic legend in connection with the relation of early masonry to the worship of fire. According to this legend, Hiram Abiff was not a descendant of Adam or Jehovah, as were the sons of Seth but was born of a nobler race, for in his blood ran the fire of Samael, one of the Elohim. Further, there are two kinds of people in the world, those with aspiration and those without. Those without aspiration are the sons of Seth, true children of the earth, who cling to their parent with tenacity, and the key word of their nature is earthiness. There is another race who are sons of fire, for they are descendants of Samael, the regent of fire. These flame-born sons are ever fired with ambition and aspiration. They are the builders of cities, the raisers of monuments, the conquerors of worlds, the pioneers, the workers in metals, true sons of the eternal flame. Fiery and tempestuous are their souls, and earth to them is a burden. Jehovah does not answer their prayers, for they are sons of another star. Aspiration is the keynote of their nature, and again and again they raise, phoenix-like, from the ashes of failure. Never will they rest like the element of which they are a part. They are wanderers upon the face of the earth with their eyes upon the flaming star from which they came. This fundamental difference is plainly visible in daily life. Some are always contented. Others never reach the goal. Some are the sons of water, the keepers of flocks. Others are sons of fire, the builders of cities, one group is conservative, the other is progressive. One is the king, the other the priest. But within the nature of every living thing, the sons of fire and the sons of water exist together. In the scriptures, the flame-born ones are called the sons of God, and the water-born are referred to as the daughters of men. For the flame-born son is the divinity in man, and the water-born is the humanity in man. These two brothers are deadly enemies, but in the mysteries they are taught to cooperate one with the other, 
and are symbolized in Freemasonry as the double-headed eagle of the 33 degree. According to the ancient wisdom, a time will come when man has two complete spinal systems, both equally developed, and his life will be controlled by two powers working in unity one with the other. To express this, the ancient alchemist symbolized attainment as a two-headed figure, one head male and the other female, the androgynous Ishwara, the planetary lord of the Brahmins, has the right half of his body male and the left half female, to symbolize that he is the archetype for the ultimate human race. Man then being positive and negative in one will no longer reproduce himself as at the present time. One of the ancient mysteries taught that the end of all things is like the beginning plus the experience of the cycle and someday the human race will give birth to its new bodies out of its own nature as certain primitive animals still do. Then indeed, will man be his own father and his own mother, complete in himself. Initiation makes possible this process in man much earlier than the natural sequence of human evolution would permit it. Such is the true mystery of Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest king, priest, water, king, fire, who was his own father and his own mother, and in whose footsteps all initiates follow. The highest of all occult orders which exists only in the inner world may be called the Order of Melchizedek, although among certain nations it has other names. This order is composed entirely of the graduates of the other mystery schools who have actually reached the point where they can give birth to their present selves out of their own natures, like the mysterious phoenix bird which breaking open at death permits a new bird to fly forth. The phoenix was once regarded as an actual zoological rarity but it is now known that it never existed other than a symbol of a high stage in the development of man. The phoenix built its nest out of flames, which is exceedingly significant. The secret order of Melchizedek can never appear in the physical world while humanity is constituted according to its present plan. It is the supreme mystery school, and a few have reached the point where they have blended their divine and human nature so perfectly that they are symbolically two-headed the heart and mind must be brought into perfect equilibrium before true thinking or true spirituality can be attained. The highest function of the mind is reason. The highest function of the heart is intuition, a sensing process not necessitating the normal working of the mind. Reason alone is heartless, feeling alone is mindless, but these two blended together temper justice with mercy and kindliness with strength. The spirit is neither male nor female, but both an androgynous entity. The perfect manifestation of the androgynous spirit must be through an androgynous body which is self-generating. But many millions of years must pass before the human race learns the lessons of polarity sufficiently well to assume this new nature with intelligence. In that day everything will be complete unto itself. Understanding will be mature and there will be a depth and broadness which cannot be manifest through either a male or a female organism alone. Such is the mystery of the priest king, and such was the position which Jesus reached when he was called a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All this is symbolized in the emblems of the 33 degree of Freemasonry. When considered clairvoyantly, the body of man resembles a great bouquet of flowers, for all over the physical form are petal-like groups of emanating force rays of various shapes and colors, there's one of these mysterious centers in the palm of each hand and in the sole of each foot. Nearly all the vital organs have whirling or radiating vortices of light as spiritual bases. These spinning, vibrating flowers are extremely important occult centers. Each of them is capable, under certain conditions, of assisting man to secure a broader function of consciousness. It is possible to see with the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. In fact, Ultimately, man will see with all parts of his body. A symbol of this ultimate condition was preserved in the Egyptian mysteries by the figure of Osiris, who is often shown sitting upon a throne, his entire body composed of eyes. The Greek god Argus was also noted for his ability to see with different parts of his body. The Oriental Buddhas are often symbolized as having peculiar geometric patterns on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. The famous footprints of Buddha carved in stone have a miniature sun just in front of the heel of each foot. Some of the Japanese jujitsu artists are acquainted with the secret science of these mysterious nerve centers, although the knowledge has been concealed from the majority of the Japanese wrestlers. 
There are charts in Japan which show the exact location of these sacred centers. The slightest pressure upon certain of them will paralyze the entire body. So great is their control over the rest of the nerve system. The jujitsu exponents are also caught how they can resuscitate a person who is absolutely dead by means of pressure brought to here on certain points in the upper vertebrae of the spine. This is successful in nearly every case, often after all other methods have failed. The sunbursts of varicolored lights in the body constitute the sacred lotus blossoms of India and Egypt and the roses of the Rosicrucians. They are also the immortal beads of the Bhagavad Gita strung upon a single thread. It is through these centers that the nails of the crucifixion were driven. The crucifixion contains the secret of opening the flower centers in the hands, feet, side and head. The three nails which accomplish this are preserved to Freemasonry as the three leading officers of a lodge and the three murderers of Hiram Abif. The Mexican Indian Osiris, called Prince Ko, died from three wounds inflicted by his enemies and his heart was found in an urn by Augustus Le Plongeon, who spent many years in investigating Central American antiquities. The relationship between these sacred centers and the jewels in the breastplate of the High Priest of Israel must not be overlooked, for both symbols have a similar meaning. The most sacred part of the human body is the brain and spinal system, revered from all antiquity and symbolized again and again in all the religions of the world. While other parts of the body are of great interest to the student, the mysterious working of the spinal fires by means of which liberation is finally attained is so tremendous that many years must be spent in understanding even the fundamental principles the spine is the rod which budded, the Yggdrasil tree, the flaming sword, the staff of comfort, the wand of the Magi. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.